Well, greetings, everyone. Um, today, we're going to talk about paint. The one thing that everyone asks when they come into the studio is, how do you do that? Uh, I can't get my colors to look like that. Um, I don't have what it takes to, to mix paint. I'm getting mucky browns. Well, let me tell you, there are many, many techniques to use paint. Um, I'm going to show you what I do. This is a very old master's technique. And first we're going to talk about paint. There are many, many different types of paint within each company. Now, each company will supply uh, data sheets about their paint. Watercolor paint, um, gouache, uh, we have alkydes if you're into that. It's kind of a mixture between acrylic and oils. And oil paint. Now some of them are really slick. Look at this. These are actual pieces of paper that have the paint on it. And notice at the top, if I can get it square, there we go. Notice at the top there are charts. And these charts will tell you whether the paint is transparent, opaque, permanent, and all kinds of other little codes. The chemical makeup of the paint is what constitutes the price. So when you're buying paint and you go, whoa, um, Scarlet Vermilion is $35 a tube? You've got to be kidding me. It's because of the chemical makeup and where it comes from. Now, all of the paint that I use, regardless what company, I right now I only use uh, Grumbacher, Winsor Newton, and uh, Daniel Smith. I have a couple of other things that, Liquitex, I have a few other things that, that uh, I kick in there. But each paint color is chosen according to the chemical makeup. If you buy phthalo green, which is this rich, 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 rich green here, from Grumbacher and mix it with anything else, you are going to get muddy gray. So if you're doing portrait work and you're trying to use greens in the shadows, you can use greens or blues. If you're using greens in the shadows, uh, you're going to get mud. If you buy phthalo, if you buy phthalo green from Windsor and Newton, it's going to stay emerald. Now this is something they don't teach in art school. And you certainly don't learn it by osmosis. You need somebody to tell you that this is going to happen. And uh, I've spent a lot of time in the portrait artist world. Um, look at this. Hair won't stay down. <laughs> uh, bad hair day. Uh, actually, it's a bad day all the way around. Notice the new uh, accoutrement for our uh, ensemble here. Um, yeah, I get to use my Canadian French. Um, Copper compression gloves, uh, coppercompression.com. That's a new uh, thing here. I suffer from um, an autoimmune disease that affects my muscles and my tendons. And uh, usually I have to have my joints shot with cortisone in here. The hands are fine, the fingers are fine, but the rotator cuffs and the shoulders are completely out. I am dying. I am just hanging in there till Monday when I can go to the surgeon and get cortisone shots in there because you would not believe how much this affects this. So right now, I've instead of the ugly tensor bandages and any other else like thing I can find, uh, this is great because it, it protects my wrists as well as my fingers as well as everything in here. But I'm in incredible pain, so I'll try not to cry. Um, all right, so getting back to paint. Uh, paint is, I, is purchased here at the studio, at the Earlham Art Studio for its chemical makeup. Colors are transparent, opaque. Some, you are never going to get anything but an opaque paint. Now, let me, let me show you, let me show you my palette. This is what makes all the magic around here. And if you notice, there are no mixed colors. Nothing is mixed. I don't 
mix a flash by taking a gob of orange and a gob of white and a gob of yellow and slapping it together and then slipping it on the on the paint uh, or on the painting everything is layered now all of my paintings are painted in black and white first but then the magic starts and the layering starts now i have um first thing we need to know let me get my marker here all right first thing we need to know is our color wheel primary colors what are the main colors if you owned no other colors in the world they are red can we see that yep okay yellow and blue if we purchased nothing else but red yellow blue black and white you could make every color under the rainbow so if you don't have the budget for paint buy those three now what are the secondary colors they are red and yellow make orange red and blue make purple and yellow and blue make green this is really terrific if you're jewish no offense intended but it's true it works out that way now if you can't remember this because it becomes very important it's great we're going to need to know this chart in order to deal with transparency because any opposite color is going to um tone down the other color and i'll show you that in a minute so how do we remember the opposite colors if we can't remember the color wheel? It's great. I teach all my students this. Think holidays. Red and green make Christmas. Orange and black, but in this case, blue, make Halloween, O-B. And yellow and purple make Easter. So all you got to think is Christmas, Easter, and Halloween, and you have your opposite colors. And I'll show you how that comes into play in a minute all right so paint is chosen for transparency now if I were to take cerulean blue look at that that is just as flat and opaque and pasty as it can get it is one of the thickest colors in terms of opacity you no light is coming through that now if i were to purchase this beautiful little color from windsor and newton called sap green whoops wait a minute gotta get enough on the brush i'm not using the right brush all right look at how thin and transparent that is that's going on just like glass It's absolutely transparent. This color is very, very important in my portrait work because I have a tendency to do portraits uh, using a paint combination that is very, very hot, very orange, very red. So if we go back to our opposite colors, what is the opposite of orange? All right, it's blue or bluish green and here we have pure orange so let's tone it down with just a very let me get another brush here this one's not big enough Come here. all right that's more better you can tell i teach english too more better all right if this orange is too hot a thin transparent layer of green or blue will tone that down. Now it is not so screaming yellow. And since my phthalo green or my sap green is transparent to begin with, I haven't changed my portrait. I haven't changed my paint strokes. I've just knocked off the intensity of the green. So this is where your opposites come into play. If your painting is too hot, too orange, Put a little blue on it if it is too purple put some yellow if your yellow is just screaming mix some purple in it tone it down now the other reason that the paints are chosen for their chemistry and why they are layered is because
here we have some very, very solid colors. But I don't make solid colors in my paintings. I never, I paint with pure color and I overlap the colors. So using the principle of overlapping, if I have this blue and I take some alizarin crimson, which is this color, and I put that over top in a very, very thin, thin, you can see how transparent it is. Look at here, look what's happening here. It's absolutely transparent. But by putting one thin coat, look at the beautiful, rich black, deep black that we've made, as opposed to uh, just pasty black. This is absolutely right out of the tube black. That's why artists, that's why most teachers will tell you never use black. Uh, I do, but it, in extreme places. So alizarin crimson over uh, the blue is making this beautiful black. Now, different things happen according to what color goes on the top, what, or what color is on the bottom, actually. So in this case, if alizarin crimson is on the bottom, and I want to put the blue on the top, I'm going to get an entirely different level do you see what happened? The blue on the bottom with the burg with the uh, alizarin crimson on top went bang, black. But the alizarin crimson on the bottom with a transparent coating of blue on the top um, is still in the burgundy side, all right? It's not black, it didn't go black fast. So the more you're layering, the more you're working on color, the more rich things are, and the more you can adjust things. Now, like I said, you notice I, I would not paint this solid to begin with, but a layer of green. Um, let's go here. All right, a layer of transparent yellow is going to bring that into a, into a beautiful gold. I'm layering, I'm layering. If I want to shift it to a little bit more brown tone, look at that. And you notice that transparently, do you see the brush strokes through? Underneath, I'm not painting out. I'm not picking up some green and some burgundy and mixing it on my palette and painting that. Because that is not as rich as this. And layer upon layer upon layer. Uh, my paintings could have, mm, could have a couple hundred coats of paint on it by the time I get to where I wanna be. Now let me show you something. Oh, and uh, I'll add something here, wait a minute. Um, the paints, I, these are all in oils. Now this will work in everything. It will work in watercolor. Layering your watercolors as opposed to mixing something and then just painting in a sky um, or water or something. Uh, acrylics work exactly the same way. You just have to be careful with acrylics because if you thin them down too much, they'll get watery and beady and they'll give you little bubbles on your painting. But with the oils, <coughs> That hurt. Uh, with the oils, I, because I'm layering and layering and layering, I want them to dry almost instantaneously. So I, I don't add any medium ever, even when I'm painting a, a portrait, a solid portrait, uh, solid meaning the colors are a little bit more opaque, faster. Um, I add no medium because I'm also an art conservator. And by adding medium, particularly a Damar varnish, Damar varnish is tree varnish, which means it is going to yellow. So by adding any type of medium that is mixed up with certain chemicals in it, your paints are going to yellow. And I don't want anything in my paint. So I mix it according to just paint. There's nothing in it. Now to do this, I need to work fast. I work uh, eight, 10, 12 hours a day for about two weeks to produce uh, uh, one of my spirit paintings. And I need this to dry fast. So I add 
a drying agent. Now, you can draw, you can use uh, Winsor & Newton Liquin. Move in there, whoop. Everything's backwards. Okay, Liquin Original, I like. There's different, different types. And you can also use Gamblin, and this is uh, Galkide. There's a light, there's a thing. Now, notice this one is drippy, and this one is not. This one is more like Vaseline kind of a deal. This is, this is my preferred drying agent uh, for most of my paintings. When I start painting into glass, I start using this. It is high gloss. Your entire painting is going to be high gloss. If you don't like that effect when you're finished, you're going to need to put a finished varnish on it that is semi-matte. Um, never, never matte varnish on an oil painting. It's just terrible. Um, so I, I usually use this when I'm painting reflective objects and glass and then tone it down. And this is the medium of choice because this is about paint consistency. Um, you're not going to be really thinning down your oil paints uh, at the same time as you're adding a drawing agent. So that's in there. Now, let me show you what I was talking about. You can get it up here. Can we get it in there? Oh, it needs to be a little higher. All right. In this portrait, it is... Um, if I can hold it with one hand, you can't imagine how heavy that is. Okay, this portrait is a, a paint combination, a skin tone combination that tends to be very hot, tends to get orange very, very fast. I would never use this with children, small, young children, because their skin tones are more pink. Um, but you can see how you can get into trouble very quickly and how this could turn very, very orange. This has a single coating of that sap green over it to knock it down, to take out the orange and keep the, keep the hot parts of the orange only where the light falls off into the shadows. Um, portraiture is another class. We'll, we'll go there, we'll get there. So let's pull this out. Mm, it is out, okay. There we go. All right, so how does this all come together? We have lions, tigers, and bears. Oh my! Um, this is a portrait of three small boys, frogs. Anybody remember that poem? Um, what are little boys made of? Made of uh, fro frogs and snails and puppy dog tails. That's what little boys are made of. That's what inspired this painting. But you see that the painting was originally painted in black and white. Everything was perfect. All the values were in. Everything was three-dimensional. And then by glazing and glazing and layering and layering, I bring out all of the detail and then start dealing with the highlights. Um, all, of the, all of the top highlights, everything hi is highlighted later. But if I wanted to change, um, you know, part of this bear, this shadow area, I don't want to go in there with a solid purple and start painting in purple because it isn't going to look like light hit our giant bear. It's going to look like just a shadowed area. So glazing over glazing. There isn't, everything is pure color. If I want to tone down something, the dark shadows in here, a layer of blues, a layer of alizarin crimson, a layer of golds if I want to take it down, and that is what ends up being the color. So this is a little bit about how I work, what colors I work, and why if you're working in any paint, any paint medium, um, media, medium, medium, uh, you need to know what your paints can do. I know what happens when you start out painting you buy the cheapest thing you can find on sale that's a green or a red or whatever. But there is method to the madness and you do need to know what your paints can do. If you've ever been in a museum and you see a, a very gorgeous classical portraits, but they have a tendency to look like they're painted with gray skin, that's because alizarin crimson, that beautiful, beautiful burgundy is the most fugitive color 
which means it's going to fade on the planet. They have now come out with alizarin crimson golden and it won't fade. So again, even as an archivist you, or uh, wanting your paintings to be around for quite a while, you need to know what your paint is going to do. It's not just about putting your painting in the sun and hanging it in the wrong place and watching it fade. Paint will fade or do something automatically according to its permanence. So stay tuned, starting Monday, you're going to start seeing the processes and the steps in one of the new spirit paintings. I'm currently working on the color collection. I'm doing a painting representing each color on the color wheel. Uh, if you go to my website, uh, www.heirloomartstudio.com and go to paintings, uh, paintings and portraits, you will see um, red and yellow. They are both up there. Each one has a title. Um, but they are both there and they are both painted in exactly the same way with layered color. Uh, starting Monday, we're going to see what happens with white. How do you paint a white painting without white paint? Stay tuned. Come back Monday. And if you're picking us up on replay, please hashtag replay and tell me where you're at. Tell me what you do. Let's start a conversation. Let's find out what everybody else is doing. Talk to you later. Bye.